Hi everybody, come on in. I'm glad to see you again. I've got some really important information I want to share with you because you're always learning when it comes to orchids and there's some things that uh, some of us don't really quite understand and I have found some very important information that might help with that. Now, <laughs> I've always cut off my spikes and there's a lot of uh, you shouldn't and you should and you shouldn't and you should and I kind of want to explain that uh, today and also before we do that I just want to explain about Epsom salts. Now Epsom salts just what you're if you've got sore muscles and you're gonna have a soak in Epsom salts in your tub that's all you need. It's a cheap way to get it and your orchids will love it. So um, I don't want to forget everything. Now some people will find that uh, some places are putting um, magnesium in the fertilizer. Now when in the winter um, you're using a different fertilizer then come spring when we put ours to a nice warm place. Um, so in the winter, oh, you went up there. Come on up. Oh, yeah. There you go. Get up. <laughs> Sorry. She's pacing back and forth because she wants up. Okay. That's Maggie. So, um, some of our fertilizers do have magnesium in already. And uh, if you remember, I went through... Um, I went through all our fertilizer and some of our nitrogen and all the different facts and I had some uh, Schultz's orchid food at the time and I really had good success with it and it does have um, the one I ordered online and I know some of you out there you went and ordered it too and it came all the way from Lithuania and we had to wait two months for it but it has, this is what I've been using um, very weekly, a quarter or a less of the recommended amount. I have four to five gallons of water in my sink. And I use a little tiny, the little spoon that comes with it. I use, that's all. Now they might say to you so much for two liters or whatever, but that's what I use to four to five gallons of water. I only use a quarter, less than a quarter of a teaspoon. And um, and that is that we're going to go into the schedule. So, but I did find that the one I ordered, it did come, here it is, with the magnesium. Now, um, some people use their Epsom salt, some will use it every watering, some not. And I did find a really good study that's fairly recent that was just done on Phalaenopsis orchids. And um, this is the schedule I'm going to go by because I do have some in my fertilizer, but when I move them outside, I changed my fertilizer to the nitrogen high. I like the first and last number. Last number is all over health, first is nitrogen. That's perfect for in the spring. So that's what we want to go for when we're trying to get leaf growth. So here is a really good schedule. And um, it says uh, uh, it's uh, element. Magnesium is essential element in orchid nutrition, um, which this fertilizer has. You can check to see if yours has it. Now, I, from what I read, I don't think it's something you should use every watering. Now, if, you're ta if your tap water or the water you're using is high in salt, then, and you're using fertilizer that has salt, what they do in time is, you've seen the pots, the flower pots all get clogged up and white, well so do the roots. The roots of your orchid will not absorb all, 
all the nutrition to keep them healthy if those roots are all caked up with salts from fertilizers or from harder water. So, believe it or not, even though it's called Epsom salt, you think, oh no, I'm giving my orchid more salt. You're not. What you're doing is helping flush all those salts from the fertilizer or from if you have the harder water with salt. And you can tell by your pots or the amount of stain that is left on maybe dishes or your shower head. So um, that's one good way of telling. So what you want to do is flush those salts out uh, once a month even, or even once every second month. There are people that, uh, because their water's not as hard or they're not collecting as much salts in their pot, that might only do it twice a year. But here's a really good schedule and uh, you can, I'll give you this information and you can go and read it. So if you dissolve one tablespoon of Epsom salt in a gallon of water and make, make sure it's all stirred up. Now, so this is how I water and now I'm going to start doing this because after reading a thesis on Philanopsis, which I'll go into. I really think it's important, and I have noticed um, uh, my orchids have been, since I started using this fertilizer, and now I'm doing this, I notice they are healthier. So, first, now, for the first, the four waterings of the month. So, for the whole month, you're going to do one water. You don't want to fertilize more than once a week. So if you're watering once a week, then for four waterings, four times a month, you're going to use your normal watering schedule. You're going to use a quarter or less of the recommended fertilizer with your orchids, okay? And I put mine in the sink and soak 10 to 15 minutes. Or sometimes if I'm doing a special one, I want to give a different fertilizer to, I'll have a bowl and put it in. And I soak them, I have a little timer, I go do some housework, I come back when the timer's off, or I'm cleaning my uh, Mr. Fogger bowls while I'm waiting. So I keep pretty active. You get good exercise looking after orchids. So there we go. Four weeks, one watering a week, four weeks, your normal fertilizing schedule. Okay, the fifth week, you use the flush with just water and Epsom salts. So the fifth week, now whether you're putting a tablespoon in a gallon of water, or if you have a bigger thing of water, you can add extra, stir it up good, and so that's your flush. You can still soak your orchids for the 10 minutes and flush them out. Now, that is just no fertilizer. That's just your water and your Epsom salts. So uh, that you've done a whole month with just your normal fertilizing schedule. Now you're going to do one flush out. And that will help get all the salts away from your roots, away from your pot, and clean out your pot. Okay, so that's actually your fifth watering, right? And uh, we're not talking twice a week water, we're talking once a week. If you're watering twice a week, just leave one, one fertilizer out. That's what I do. Like if I have to give some extra watering, it's just water. So, four waterings, normal fertilizer schedule. Then, followed by the one tablespoon of Epsom salt in a gallon of water flush to clean it out. Next watering is just water. No fertilizer, just water. So you can keep track of that on your calendar or just have a piece of paper like I have a little kit with all my stuff in for my orchids and I keep it there. So we've got that straight. <laughs> <laughs> you can play it back. <laughs> I'll try not and repeat it again. So 
I like to be conservative with fertilizing schedule because I don't know how to explain this anymore. Orchids are slow growing and that's the biggest problem most people run into because you get your orchid and um, it's been in messy moss or what it's been in and it's not healthy. Now you repot it and you think that you know in the next month everything's going to be fine. It's not. Orchids are slow growing and what happened to them two months ago or in the grocery store may not show up for another two months. So when you go back into the pot and you check your orchid a month or so after you've repotted it, yes, you will find some dead roots, right? Because changing from any medium to any medium, the, the roots that grew, grew for the medium it's originally in, their, their structure is made for that type of uh, medium. And when you change that medium, they have to grow whole new roots so that they can live in the new medium. Now, if you're just going from the same medium to the same medium, you won't run into that problem. But you will run into the problem of how that orchid was cared for months before you got it. And that's why I always check if I see one doesn't look good, I check inside the pot. Remove any mushy things. Mushy things will tell you too much water. Dry, dry, dry roots will tell you it needs a little more water. So, anyway, that is our little Epsom Salts um, discovery, and this is what I'm going to be following myself. Now, the other thing I want to discuss, <laughs> I'm hitting all the topics that uh, uh, there's lots of debate on uh, uh, through YouTube or blogs, and I read a lot. If you sat down at my computer and put phalaenopsis anything and all the stuff comes up, you've been here two times, you've been here three times, I read a lot. So, um, and that's how I found this article and it was a very good article. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is inflorescence pruning. Now, I know it's, don't be mean if it's green, uh, <laughs> If it's brown and it's dead, then it can shed or whatever. Okay, now, um, I've always liked cutting mine off because I always said it, it takes, your plant can't, um, you want, if you got a, an unhealthy plant or one that's struggling, if you leave the spike on, it takes away the energy that the plant needs because it's using energy to grow to try and grow more flowers. And I finally found this article that explained that. And just remember, if your orchid's in the wild, you know, people say, well, they don't cut it off. But we are growing a little bit different in the wild. Why? Because we want our flowers to last months. When I take you on a tour after this, you'll see some of these have been in bloom since December. They're still getting buds and going. But if they were in the wild, all the bees and all the pollination would be taking place and the fall flowers would be falling off. Yes, they're not cutting off their spikes. No one's running around trimming them. But they're not after what we're after, which is we want to keep our flowers. So anyway, um, to conserve energy and to force the plant to rest in preparation for a good presentation of flowers in the following blooming season, the inflorized essence is cut off to its lowest point with a sterilized tool. This prevents an enzyme produced in the nodes and in the tip of the inflorescence, which keeps the plant in reproductive mode from entering the plant and allowing the plant to devote all its energies 
to growth following a brief rest. So I've always felt that, but this was a really good study. I'm going to show you where you can look. There's lots of it. Some of it's a little like over my head and I had trouble understanding, but there was a lot that you could understand. So I'll, I'll give you that information. But so, um, and somewhere else I read that, um, okay, if you want to leave them on for a while, you know, fine. But if you're getting flowers for, from this beautiful orchid for four or five months, don't you think it deserves a rest? And they've also proved that when the flowers do start to come, you're going to get a, a nice, healthier bunch of flowers, bigger flowers. And I know I'll probably hear some, but I, I'm going to give you this article, so if you disagree, you can go read about it. So, um, and then if you didn't really understand me, you can go back and read that. Um, so this article, I'm going to share a couple other things with you. This article was called Regulation of Flowering in Philanopsis Orchids. Research work by a doctor of philosophy and horticulture. And at the Falcon, anyway, a lot of this, it's in India, it's very good, and I, I, I don't want to uh, pronounce his name wrong, I'm going to give you a close-up, and I, if you type in to your search, regulation of flowering in Philanopsis orchids, and I'll show you a close-up of his name, and, um, this was a thesis just on Philanopsis orchids. So I'll try and get in here. So anybody want to write that down? It's very good. Thesis, see? Doctor of Philosophy in Horticulture. So this is very, very good article. Now, here goes my challenge. Um, now, there was a few other things that I, I, I took out of there, um, is uh, the other thing, um, if you have a orchid that uh, is uh, wrinkly leaves or having trouble, now um, this will help. And if you have a, a humidifier, right? So. Um, the best time, and I leave, I get up in the morning, and the first thing I do is I turn my, my humidifiers on, unless it's raining outside, and my lights. And uh, at night, and it could be, say, 10 o'clock, 10.30, I turn it all off. But you know what? If you have one that's suffering, you could leave it by one humidifier because what happens is um, there um, they open up uh, they partly the leaves that let the moisture in uh, and they partly open up at uh, uh, sunrise and sunset but they're all the way open at night. So they're going to gather more humidity because they're used to in the day when everything heats up. So they don't lose moisture, they close up. So really, <laughs> I should have been um, leaving when I was nursing one. Put one, you know how I, I have my humidifier, I'll show you a close up, and I have a tea, tea, uh, tea tree, uh, um, a tea candle thing and I put a plate on top and I put an orchid usually one that I'm given special care so if I did that at night it would actually probably do it more good than in the day because it's more open to receiving this humidity so um, the stomata remains closed so as to conserve moisture within the plant 
So this is important. The stomata remain open during the night and partly open during daybreak and dusk. So this is also more very interesting stuff in this article. And also, um, a lot of people say, oh, my orchid isn't flowering. So um, they, they like the, um, environmentally, they, they need the Phalaenopsis. It's been proven they like a, a photo period. They like a, a cool down 10 to 15 degrees for maybe three weeks in the evening, whether you're opening your window. Um, I leave mine out in the fall, so in the fall we've got warmer days, but we got the cooler nights, so it's getting it there. Some people, if they don't have that varying temperature degrees, put a big bowl of ice every night by your orchids. Open a crack, open a window, move them to a cooler room, but they still need light. And uh, light quality and day length and low temperature will really aid um, in helping get your spike. So there's lots of reading there. And um, what else did I want to talk about? Okay, this one, this one, yeah. Um, I always have when, okay, uh, and I'll go into it more when I do it, but when I move mine out to the patio, won't be till their flowers are gone. I will cut the spike down to the ground, one or two nodes above. I usually leave about an inch and a half or two and put a little bit of cinnamon on it. And then they start their growth period. We want, what do we want? We, uh, According to this, our, uh, heavy fertilizer was found to have better vegetative growth and more flower count in Phalaenopsis when they did flower. So they need that fertilizing in the with your high nitrogen and your last number um, in the spring when we're going to put them out for their growth period because the more roots, the more leaves they're going to grow, the healthier and the more abundant our flowers will be. That's when they're gathering their sugars and, uh, to, and air, all the energy they're going to need when they do produce their flowers. And it was also proven, and there was many tests, many pictures, plants respond to a higher nitrogen rate by producing larger leaves. So um, uh, really, go on and read this. And the other thing is, um, they also found that uh, 30 degrees centigrade, or say 86 Fahrenheit, I always found, you know, as soon as I put them outside, it's warm all day, summer's coming. Sometimes it was 90, 95. I put a fan on them, I have their humidity going, but they're in the shade and they're on the cool side of the house. So they took that heat because that's a glassed in room. And they took that heat with no problem. And, and they're saying, at least 86, which they might not get in your house if you're somewhere hot and you've got air conditioning going. They do do like that warmth for their growth, for the growth of their leaves and their roots. So um, that was also, so um, go on and read that article. And now what I'm going to do is I'll give you a short tour. It, we went into town and it was uh, minus 12. It was cold. Mom and I went and our noses were even getting cold running here and there. So, But it is beautiful. The birds are singing outside and the sun is shining, but it is cold. And so this is why I made a couple changes with my humidity. I took my humidity bowl off my kitchen counter and replaced the, the small fountain. And I found my humidity went up. So the misting fogging bowls actually do work better than the fountain. So I moved it off the counter over. You'll see on the tour. And it did help with the humidity because uh, it's been cold and dry and the furnace has been on. And uh, uh, never fear, they're predicting a long, warm spring. So I'll take you on a tour and uh, that'll be it. Okay, so, whoops, whoops, so, <laughs> surprise, surprise, okay, 
Now, we've got some surprises. Now, this is the one I repotted in the last video. Uh, no flowers have dropped. This about don't repot them, their flowers will drop. Not true, not true. Be gentle, be loving, repot it. And I even changed the medium. So here it is. And when they're, they, I keep it a little more in the shade in a warmer spot. So we're just waiting for it to, when spring comes, all these plants you're worrying about, that's when they'll start their growth. Now next to it, the one with the lampshade that's actually upside down, and I put it in a, um, it was a, a fondue pot holder. Uh, and this one was in flower. I went back and checked. This one was in flower, full flower at Christmas. And so here we are into March, and it's still looking really good. And down in here, you see more butts. So, um, and we over here have Tequila Sunrise. This is one that struggled for a while, but look at, she has lots of leaves. The first couple did, uh, uh, were soft when it was first potted, but look, it just did good and it flowered. And they are just beautiful. So, and over here, don't give up on them. This one struggled to two leaves and almost died. And it's also, so how many months are we going to get? Do they deserve a rest after this? Yes, they do. Even Maggie likes her rest. Where is she? Yeah, she likes her rest. <laughs> okay. And over here, the mini orchis. This one's still left. Okay, healthy, lots of roots. <clears throat> I changed my watering day till Thursdays because grad seasons come. Grad sales. And so I don't want to miss out on that. Here's Moon Glow, still since December. Getting more buds inside. Very healthy. This is when you can let them keep getting their buds. This is when you can in really enjoy them. And we have another one back in here. Get in here. Boy, we're so thick with flowers. It's tricky moving. <laughs> okay, so here's my Mr. Fogger off of the kitchen counter. So... Uh, the mist will fall down. My daughter said, yeah, the mist goes down, Mom. So now I have some going up and some going down. <laughs> so, yes, okay, I'll check out my humidity for you and my temperature. I keep one here just so it's, a, it's uh, okay. It's not great humidity, but for this weather, it is great. So it's uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 humidity. And the temperature, uh, it's about 65. It's cooler in the window. So we don't run a real hot house here. But <laughs> So this is from the garden show. It bloomed in December. It's on my Christmas video. Still blooming. And this is the one I did in the Salmon Arm Garden Club video that Jack filmed. Where I gave the talk. It, this is the one I repotted. It's in blue. And up here, and surprise, and I'm so happy. Look at these leaves. Now, big pots, yeah, they say they don't like big pots. Now, we do, this pot only goes to about where the holes end here because we put a screen in. But still, that's a nice sized pot. It spent more time growing leaves and roots before it flowered. But nice, long, healthy spike. And look at this, if I can get in here. Look at, I've been waiting for this. It is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. So, um, 
We'll just go back into the other room now. I hate to move too fast. Oh, maybe I should show you quick. I'm going to turn around. And up there, I'll try and get a close-up. I finished my painting. <laughs> it's up there, and I'm going to do my own for each side of these. And we're going to move the other ones to a different room. But I finished my, my painting and decided to put it up. So try and give you a bit of a close up. <laughs> oh, I'm crazy. Hey, no one else would probably put it in their house, but I love just playing. And it's our house, we can put them up. <laughs> okay, now we're off to the other room. Okay, so here we have one just opening and more coming. And this one is hasn't opened yet. We're just waiting. And here's my oldest one, my purple one, that I am concerned about. But I'll be cutting that spike off for sure so it can go out and really do good. And over here, we have another one in bloom. Very nice. And I'm still waiting for my slipper orchid, now nicknamed Slowpoke. It's not dead, but we have some more open back here and back here. And the Mr. and Foggers are going, and everything is looking good. And I'm going to give you a peek out the front window at what it is like out there. I say it's minus 12 and I'll show you these mountains. It's sunny and blue sky and cold. Yeah. It's as close as you're gonna see, boy. It's uh that's winter still, but they say it's coming. So thank you for joining me and have some looking have some fun today and read that article and we'll see you next time.